Um, I've, I, I was sick for several weeks with a bad um, congestion and so on, and I have a lingering cough from it, so I'm going to apologize in advance if I break out in a terrible coughing fit. Um, now, we had a little issue here with setting up the equipment, and so I don't see my notes. Um, that, in fact, shall I try to find them? Maybe I shouldn't. No, nah, nah, I'll, just, I'll just wing it. <laughs> So my topic is a utilitarian perspective on companion animals, and what's informing this talk are four pieces of work, um, two of which are in print and two of which are in progress. I was invited to give a paper or write a paper for a uh, forthcoming anthology on companion animals under this topic, a utilitarian perspective on them, because I previously published a paper um, in another anthology in 2002 titled Pets, Companion Animals, and Domesticated Partners, and I'll introduce that distinction as I make it in this talk today. Um, the other paper, uh, the, the paper that's forthcoming, is actually called A Two-Level Utilitarian Perspective on Companion Animals, and it's forthcoming in that uh, volume, Pets and People. And you'll understand why I qualify it by saying a two-level utilitarian perspective as we proceed. Um, I was invited to in contribute that paper to the forthcoming anthology because I previously published a book uh, titled Personhood Ethics and Animal Cognition, Situating Animals in the Two-Level Utilitarianism of R. M. Hare. And I have a sequel to that in progress, which will be titled um, Sustaining Animals, Envisioning Humane Sustainable Communities. And although the first book, that's in print already, doesn't say anything about pets, the second book will um, incorporate my thinking on them that I'm going to summarize today. And that's still in progress, uh, not even in galley form or anything yet. So any feedback I have during this presentation from you and in our subsequent discussions this afternoon could improve the work that I do. Well, what I'm going to do in the presentation today is four things. Uh, describe what two-level utilitarianism is, very briefly. Give those three categories, definitions of those three categories of pets that I mentioned earlier. <coughs> Give my reasons for thinking that pet keeping is justifiable uh, in utilitarian terms, and then close with looking at some different strategies for improving our relationships with pets um, from the perspective of this two-level view that emphasizes the distinction among uh, laws, codes of professional ethics, and what I'll call common morality. So to move to the first topic, uh, to describe two-level utilitarianism, utilitarianism gets some bad press. It's, um, it, there, there's a, a deprecating sense in which you say, well, that's a very utilitarian truck that you're driving there, Gary, which means something like, well, you know, it works, but it's not comfortable. Of course, that's not the sense that philosophers have in mind when they think about utilitarianism. The OED also includes this characterization of principles or a philosophy that regards the greatest good or happiness of the greatest number as the chief consideration or rule of morality. And in that philosophical sense, utilitarianism is often summarily dismissed using certain kinds of counterexamples because the thought is, well, Sometimes, it, under some circumstances, what would do, uh, cause the greatest good for the greatest number would be enslaving a very small portion of the population for the sake of benefiting a whole bunch of people. Or they'll say things like, well, uh, if you think of it in terms of doing whatever, if you think of it in terms of being the view that what's right is whatever will maximize aggregate happiness under the circumstances, lots of times lying might maximize aggregate happiness, punishing the innocent. There are all these favorite, uh, uh, famous counterexamples to utilitarianism. And the two-level view is designed to in part to address those. And I like to summarize utilitarianism in exactly these words, that it's the view that you should arrange things so as to maximize aggregate happiness. And the arranged things, there is a subtle change in wording, but it's significant because what I'm going to say is that if you're a convinced utilitarian, you actually have good reasons for arranging things so that you don't think like a utilitarian all the time. And that's the origin of this uh, two-level view. I think a good way to introduce the two-level view is to contrast it with what philosophers often call act utilitarianism, the view that the right thing to do is under any circumstances that you happen to find yourself in, ask yourself what would maximize aggregate happiness if I did it here. And that's where you end up doing things like punishing the innocent under some circumstances and so on. But to introduce why a utilitarian has reason not to think like a utilitarian much of the time, I think it's good to talk in terms of an analogy with what I'll characterize as 
act ethical egoism. So suppose I took a philosophy class in, you know, in my freshman year and I became rationally convinced that the right thing to do is whatever will maximize my own happiness under the circumstances. <coughs> I think I would pretty quickly argue myself out of going around thinking like that all the time because most people say that selfless loving relationships are among the greatest goods that people enjoy and that contribute in a very significant way to human happiness. So if I literally walked around thinking like that, calculating constantly what was going to be in my best in own best interests, I'd miss out on some of the best goods uh, or co best contributions to human happiness that are available. Well, similarly, if I walked around thinking consciously, calculating what was going to maximize aggregate happiness, as the utilitarian does, it's kind of like a generalization of the egoist view, but saying, let's do what's best for everybody affected on average or on the whole. But if I went around calculating like that, um, I don't think I'd make a very good friend, lover, or companion animal keeper, frankly. So a utilitarian, a, a, an ethical egoist, to go back to the, the one-person scenario, would quickly convince themselves that they shouldn't always walk around calculating about what's going to uh, maximize their own self-interest. Their general critical level principle might be something like arrange things so that my own happiness will be maximized. But in order to achieve that, you'd want to train yourself to act in accordance with what I'll label intuitive level system rules, which would in roughly include something like don't think like an egoist all the time. Put your loved one's interests above your own, things like that. The two-level utilitarian view is a direct analog of this. The utilitarian's going to miss out on some of the best goods in human life if they're consciously calculating like a utilitarian all the time. So they should instead say that, well, my general view is I'm going to arrange things so that I can maximize aggregate happiness over time. Part of that's going to involve not thinking like a utilitarian explicitly all the time because I'd miss out on all kinds of things and that contribution to aggregate happiness would be lost. Now, there are several reasons that in, uh, utilitarians need what I'm calling intuitive level rules. So the idea is you have a two-level system. Utilitarianism is the driving background principle, but it drives you to arrange things so that you have internalized certain intuitive level rules that you act sort of habitually according to. You act, judge, and so on in, uh, consistently with them. And one of the reasons for needing those is the one I just gave. And by the way, R.M. Herrer, the utilitarian that I've started my work from and kind of organized my thinking around, never mentions that reason for not thinking like a utilitarian all the time. He gives some other reasons, though. For instance, that in various cir circumstances, extremely detailed information would be required to accurately apply the principle of utility and figure out with certainty what's going to maximize aggregate happiness. Another one is that even if you had access to all the data, sometimes it's extremely complex and humans just, real world flesh and blood humans have limited data processing abilities and make mistakes. And finally, there's a fourth reason that Hare does emphasize a lot and that is there's a tendency to, for us to cook the data and convince ourselves incorrectly, it turns out, that doing what we happen to find in our own interests or what we happen to want to do is also going to maximize happiness. Hare refers to that as cooking the data in favor of, 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 uh, of self-interest. And for this combination of reasons then, what we should do as utilitarians is think, how could we arrange things so that we avoid these kinds of problems that would arise if we went around consciously calculating as a utilitarian all the time? And Hare, oh, by the way, here's a, another slide to illustrate. Um, I use the expression internalize these rules so that they're sort of a moral autopilot. Hare emphasizes that in order to guard against cooking the data in favor of self-interest, the intuitive level rules have to be internalized in such a way that you're diffident or you know, hesitant to violate them. And even, he says, so that when under extreme circumstances you do calculate like a utilitarian and think that you're probably justified in violating even a very important rule, it should still look to you intuitively as if what you did was wrong. He says if you haven't internalized the rule in that deep way, so that it's moral autopilot, then it's not going to work to guard against cooking the data. And the corridor illusion is a good illustration of this. There are various cases in human processing, uh, cognitive processing of various kinds where there's an output of an intuitive, fast-acting system, the visual system, that gives you the impression that the upper figure is actually taller 
than the bottom figure. And the way I think I should put it is it looks like it occupies slightly more space on the screen. But if you go up there with a me and measure it down to the half millimeter, they are exactly the same size. Measuring to the millimeter is like explicitly calculating as a utilitarian, but the result of deciding, okay, they're actually the same size, doesn't make them not look the same, or it doesn't make them, oh, I'm sorry, I said it backwards, yeah. The result of calculating is they're exactly the same size, but they still look to the output of your intuitive visual system, they look different sizes. That's the way you're supposed to, according to Hare, internalize these intuitive uh, level rules. Now, I, <clears throat> Hare does not use this acronym, but I like the acronym ILS for Intuitive Level System Rules. And I like it because in aviation, ILS stands for Instrument Landing System, which allows you to line up with your approach to the, air, to the runway and match your descent in the right way so that you can land safely even when you can't see the runway coming until you're right on top of it. <coughs> it's also nice to just have a nice handy um, acronym of ILS instead of saying intuitive level system rules. So from here on, I'm going to refer to ILS rules, and that's what I mean. Hare emphasizes that there are at least three different kinds of these things. Uh, the laws of a legal system can be seen as an intuitive level system. If you imagine a legislature full of utilitarians, they might for various reasons think, we should pass certain laws and punish people for not obeying them because on the whole, things will work better and you know, the society will function better. So that's how a utilitarian would view laws in this two-level system, is as a species, as it were, of intuitive level rule. Codes of professional ethics are another category. The difference between laws and codes of professional ethics is that codes of professional ethics are only uh, apply to um, a subset of the whole population, whereas laws apply to everybody. Then there's what, he, what I call common morality, and by this I mean some set of norms that we, uh, a group or subgroup of society agree on and that are a sort of set of background agreements that they, they can all count on each other uh, um, agreeing to with regard to various practices and so on. There's a bunch of mushiness and complication there because how do you identify a group or a subgroup that has a uniform set uh, of, of norms that they do in fact agree to? I admit that it's a mushy thing. It's also mushy in the following way. Laws and codes of professional ethics are both written down somewhere, and there are formal processes for amending them over time. With regard to common morality, there's no formal process for amending it. And worse yet, I think with regard to some of our common sense moral commitments, like the commitment to keeping promises, for instance, I don't think you can even specify precisely in words what our shared understanding about that rule is. Any way you write it out, you're going to be able to think of some possible situations that wouldn't quite be covered by the rule. And it seems like that in that part of our moral thinking, humans' moral judgment is more like the judgment that a connectionist system would make if it has been trained up on examples over time of a six versus a two written on a page, for instance, but never programmed with any explicit rule to follow. Such a system over time, learning from paradigm cases, internalizes a, what's sometimes called a paradigm space that causes it to make the same discriminations between twos and sixes that a human would. But again, without being, anybody being able to write down an exact rule that it's following. I think our common sense, common morality is often uh, like that, and so there's no formal process for amending it. And this will be significant in some of what I want to say later on. I'd also emphasize that I think that if you're a utilitarian, you're committed at the intuitive level to a kind of pragmatism. And that is that every generation finds itself having inherited a set of laws, a set of professional ethics for different subsets of the society, and a common morality from the past. And if you're trying to do your best in the, real mur uh, the murky real world as a utilitarian, you have to ask yourself every generation, what did we inherit from the past and how can we tweak those things in various ways to try to improve the degree to which we're maximizing aggregate happiness as a society? So now, onto the second point, and this is going to be purely stipulative. I, I published that essay titled Pets, Companion Animals, and Domesticated Partners. So what I'm going to do here is just give you definitions of those terms as I define them. There's the background question of what is a pet? Um, versus what I'll call a mere pet. I don't have anything novel to say about the, our general concept of a pet. I think that Barbara Barnbaum in a 1998 essay in, of all places, the Journal of Philosophy for Children, 
hit the nail pretty much on the head. And so I'll just quickly relate her criteria for something counting as a pet. Um, it ha a pet is, uh, a, the pet keeper feels affection for it, although not necessarily vice versa. The pet leads a very different kind of life than its keeper, so you can't keep a human and have it qualify as a pet. Uh, a pet lives in an area significantly under the keeper's control, so when I feed uh, a, a, a raccoon in the backyard, that doesn't count as a pet because I don't have some kind of substantial control over it. Um, although if I have a horse in a barn somewhere else that I go and work with, that still counts as an area under my control. And finally, a pet depends on its keeper to have various important needs met. She thinks that these rule out Tamagotchis, those old, that old silly toy, counting as pets, and a bunch of other uh, cases that we would all say, no, 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 come on, that's not really a pet, a rock, for instance, or something like that. So given that that's our kind of general conception of a pet, I want to distinguish three categories within that class of pets. And the first is, this one won't seem surprising at all, this is just my own way of kind of summarizing what I think our common sense notion of a companion animal is. It's a pet, by Barnbaum's criteria, that, give, uh, that receives affection and care from the owner and also has significant social interaction with its owner and would voluntarily choose to stay with the owner in part for the sake of that companionship. Big accordion term in there, right? Would voluntarily choose to stay with the owner. You can think of examples in human relationships where people, someone, in scare quotes, voluntarily uh, stays, wants to stay with their partner, but from the outside we see that it's a dysfunctional relationship. I admit that's a problem. I don't have anything definitive to say about that, but for our purposes I hope that we can get, I can get by with the kind of general notion of a pet that wants to stay with the owner because it enjoys the companionship with them would safely qualify as a companion animal. There may be cases that we want to dispute about, but that's the general idea. Now what about a domesticated partner? Now this is pretty stipulative of me. It's a companion animal, pet, that works with humans in ways that emphasize and exercise the pet's mental and or physical faculties in a healthy way. Again, a difficult phrase in here is works in, in ways that benefit, that are healthy for it. You could think of complex working relationships that end up not being healthy for the animal, even though the animal seems to enjoy it or something. But my idea here is to map out a category where if, we, if it's not such a problematic example, we would agree that this is a companionship relationship that's much more nuanced and dedicated and specific than companion animals that don't count as domesticated partners, that don't have that sophisticated working relationship with their humans. And then finally, the other term I'll introduce is a mere pet, by which I mean something that qualifies as a pet but doesn't seem to qualify as either a companion animal or a domesticated partner. Now I introduce these terms um, not just because, as a friend of mine likes to joke, what does a philosopher do in an emergency? He makes a distinction. <laughs> So philosophers are fond of making distinctions and giving stipulative definitions, but I like to use these categories in talking about ways in which pet keeping can be justifiable from a utilitarian perspective. And here, oh, I'm sorry, I first wanted, this is why I can't see my notes, okay. Um, I wanted first, though, to give you some examples of what I think count as domesticated partners. So it seems to me that working dogs of various kinds count as domesticated partners, and not surprisingly, because uh, dogs have been domesticated for thousands of years and during that time have worked in very complicated ways with herding, uh, at more recent, and, and as beasts of burden, and then more recently as search and rescue dogs and military dogs. But also there are dogs that seem to me to qualify very clearly. I think they're paradigm examples of domesticated partnerships that aren't involved in work and agility course work with uh, dogs seems to me like a good example of an enriched relationship between an owner and, and the pet that I think clearly would qualify as more than just a companion animal. It's a domesticated partnership you got going there. Do what? Can you oh. both yeah, actually, the way I defined it, I said a, a domesticated partner is a companion animal that does this other more sophisticated stuff. And that leads to the following objection in, from some people. They'll say, well, wait a minute, there might be certain working dogs that seem to fit the domesticated partner. Uh, model except that they're not really companion animals because the person who works with them doesn't like them or something like that. 
I admitted at the beginning that I was stipulating these definitions and there were some woolly edges around them. It's more uh, what I want to talk in terms of in justify, the justifiability of, of pet keeping is the paradigm clear cases of them. So I'm talking about when I say domesticated partner, I mean a dog that works with a human and they really like each other. And thanks for that uh, clarification, by the way. Um, horses, it seems to me, the, the other species that comes directly to mind when I think, well, what are some examples of domesticated partners that humans have? And horses seem like the other really, really clear example. Um, by the way, barrel racing is my favorite rodeo sport, um, and I'm not sure I like any other rodeo sport, but barrel racing looks to me like, you know, you couldn't do that if you weren't really working together. Oh, there is one interesting comment I want to make about um, cutting horse competitions. Cutting horses, you couldn't get the animal to perform um, up to competition level in a cutting horse competition if you didn't have this really sophisticated working relationship with it. But it strikes me when I watch cutting horses perform that you know, by the time they're in the ring, the rider's role is just to select which animal the horse is going to cut. And then they're just along for the ride, literally, after that. So it's a really interesting relationship in that case. <coughs> A pretty clear case of animals that are commonly, com commonly count as companion animals by my uh, conception, but are rarely domesticated partners would be cats. And by the way, in the upper left there is my feral cat, Maggie, and in the bottom right, uh, the bucket of kittens there are the kittens she uh, gave birth to a couple of weeks after I trapped the feral cat in my house. Uh, more on that later, perhaps. but. However, I do, I actually wanted to show a video as you were walking in of the acro cats performing on Colbert. Did anybody see this? A couple of people did. Um, it, they didn't perform 100% accurately, let's say. <laughs> But what they get those cats to do convinces me that if you're sensitive about it, um, you can develop a full-blown domesticated partnership, kind of the analog of an agility course for cats. And it seems to me that even average cat owners like myself can do basic things like teach cats to come on command, to go into a carrier to eat, uh, to respond, to desist when told no, things like that. That might not be a full-blown domesticated partnership, but it's kind of moving in that direction from someone who just has the cat in the house and it comes and cuddles and that's the end of it. And, and it doesn't stop when they say no and it can't come on command and so on. How about mere pets? Uh, herpetofauna, reptiles and amphibians seem to me, given my experience, animals that can be pets, but I'm not sure I've known any cases of them really qualifying as companion animals. Um, more so uh, when it comes to invertebrates and fish, although I've had some people think that their fish were responsive to them in certain ways. And I had someone who told me he kept a slug as a pet as a kid, but I really don't think that was ripe for a companion animal relationship. So these are some what I take to be paradigm examples of mere pets on the one hand, companion animals, and then domesticated partners on the other. How would you justify keeping pets f um, under, falling under those three definitions if you're thinking in explicitly utilitarian terms about the institution of pet keeping? Should we allow it in the law and other categories of ILS rules that I introduced earlier? Well, it seems to me um, that it is justifiable uh, not to say that the institution as we have it now is perfectly justified and needn't be modified in various ways, but at least some forms of pet ownership seem to be completely justifiable in utilitarian terms, and three empirical considerations inspire me to that conclusion. One is that there's some evidence, although the evidence is a bit ambiguous, uh, that keeping pets, even mere pets, improves the health of, of human beings psychologically and in terms of physical health. The evidence is somewhat ambiguous, but it, uh, and so I can't say that the question is settled, but it seems to me that it's likely that there are benefits that we get from having pets, even mere pets. Secondly, if a pet meets my de stipulative definition of a companion animal, it's written right in there, right, that it wants to stay with you. Because there can be dysfunctional relationships, that's not a definitive proof that it's getting something out of the relationship, that it's enjoying it too, but it's at least prima facie evidence that the animal um, is benefiting from the relationship as well. And then finally, <clears throat> for pets that meet my stipulative definition of a domesticated partner, behavioral problems, which are definitely the leading cause of strife in humans' relationships uh, with pets, can be controlled more effectively. And also, it seems to me that humans' relationships with them tend to be more satisfying than our relationships with companion animals. 
I'm not claiming that I have empirical proof of that. It sounds right to me, based on my experience and watching other people with various animals, I don't claim that it's uh, proven empirically, and I don't claim that it's a, a categorical truth, but it seems likely to me that if I have a companion animal and I develop a more sophisticated relationship like a domesticated partnership, approximating it at least, we're, it's going to feel, it's going to be better for me and for the pet. So <clears throat> the conclusions I draw are that the practice of pet keeping is justifiable from a utilitarian perspective, although keeping mere pets may sometimes be a good thing. It's generally better to keep a companion animal rather than a mere pet. And not surprisingly, it's generally good <clears throat> for pet keepers to develop to the extent practicable a domesticated partnership with their companion animals. And in explicitly utilitarian terms, uh, philosophers don't get to draw graphs very much. So these slides may not be necessary, but I took time to learn to draw a graph for the first time. So I'm going to impose them on you. So here's, <clears throat> so for keeping it simple, suppose you just have one person. I live alone uh, in terms of human companionship alone. And there I am, and let's arbitrarily assign me some utility level, happiness level of 10 units. Well, if I were just looking at the situation, my situation in isolation, then the aggregate utility is just my utility of 10. But if I bring even a mere pet into the house, and the mere pet is living a life that's at least as good or better than it would have lived in the wild, um, then it's benefiting, it, it's increasing the aggregate happiness in the household. And also, remember we said that even mere pets make individual owners better off. So watch the smile. Oops, what happened? Oh, I hit the wrong button. There we go. The smile got bigger, see? <laughs> <laughs> and that means that aggregate utility is further increased by having the companion animal. But now if I, or I'm sorry, a mere pet, but now if I add a companion animal to the household, it seems to me that both the companion animal probably lives a richer, more happy life, usually, than a mere pet does, because they're outright enjoying the companionship of their human. And I also, this is my speculation, I can't prove this empirically, but it seems to me probably companion animals benefit us psychologically as humans and physically as humans a little bit more than mere pets. And then same thing with if I have, um, uh, if I develop a domesticated partnership, if my speculation earlier about the quality of human relationships being enhanced for the human and the animal that is uh, nurtured into this domesticated partnership, then the utility is even further heightened. So those, <clears throat> graphically speaking, those are my reasons for um, thinking that pet keeping is justified with the qualifications about mere pets versus companion animals versus domesticated partners. Um, now I move on to the final point, which is strategies for improving our relationships with pets. Within a two-level utilitarian system, remember there are discrete types of ILS or intuitive level rules, laws, professional ethics, and common morality. So I want to give an example of, of within each category, at least one example, of how a utilitarian doing explicitly utilitarian thinking now about how to modify those ILS rules that you've inherited from previous generations to improve from a utilitarian perspective our institution of pet keeping as we've inherited it. Well, there are those three categories, remember, and then there's the type of pragmatism where you take those that you've inherited laws and other kinds of intuitive level system rules, and you have to ask yourself realistically, how much good can we accomplish in our lifetimes having inherited the laws and the common morality and so on that we have from the past? What are the strategies that are most likely to pay off and us be able to put into practice to improve the institution? Well, with regard to <clears throat> changing our laws regarding pets, um, a really simple suggestion for thinking about a legal framework is given in a nice essay by David Fraser and Catherine, I think it is, Shoop back in 2000 called, uh, titled A Framework for Assessing the Suitability of Different Species as Companion Animals. And <clears throat> what they did was uh, give a list of 12 questions that they thought <clears throat> legislators in a community should ask themselves or ask a panel of experts. And they had to do with things like um, <clears throat> how difficult to manage and meet the needs of the, uh, uh, the animal was in terms of meeting its needs well, uh, procurement issues about where the source of the pets were coming from, and other environmental issues of, uh, that might be raised by having the species of animal in the domestic setting and the kind of th so things that can go wrong. And so they suggest that basically legislators either themselves or ask a panel of experts <clears throat> 
to try to categorize animals reasonably in their best judgment into five categories. And the first is needs are easily met. Two examples that they give that they think fall into this category would be uh, mice and hamsters. Category B was, well, requires significant time, but the needs are still easily met, fairly easily met by the average person if they put the time in. And not surprisingly, there they, they categorize dogs and cats, most cases of dogs and cats in that category. Category three is animals that have complex or demanding requirements, needing skillful and knowledgeable owners. And the two examples they give here are falconry on the one hand, keeping falcons, and green iguanas on the other. They then have a final category of unsuitable as companion animals. And here they give as their explicit examples um, uh, snakes and uh, large cats, not domesticated cats. And then they, uh, they allude to, well, there may be some dog breeds that fall into this category. They didn't mention a breed by name, and I intentionally did not put a pit bull up there because I knew that somebody would say, you've got that wrong, man, they're misunderstood. So I just put a caricature of a vicious dog over there. The missing category D, by the way, is throw up our hands, we don't know enough about the species to make a judgment about whether to put it in A, B, C, or E. And the idea then is this is a framework for a legislator have, legis legislature having inherited a set of laws governing uh, pets and thinking about how to tweak them. So they say, for instance, a, a community might decide to make it illegal to keep animals listed in category E, or they might require for C and or E, uh, the kinds of things that, uh, the special regulations that apply to falconry, at least in the United States, where you have to demonstrate that you have a certain kind of training and you even have to be inspected by, uh, by authorities. So it's a flexible framework for taking laws, tinkering with them, and this can be seen from a utilitarian perspective as a way of modifying our ILS rules to try to improve the institution of pet keeping. Now what about codes of professional ethics? It seems to me that standards of organizations like the American Kennel Club and the Canadian Kennel Club are sufficiently analogous to codes of professional ethics to kind of put them in this category when you're thinking as a two-level utilitarian. They're explicitly written down, breed standards for instance, and there are presumably some kind of formal mechanisms that would have to be used to amend them over time. Um, ear cropping and tail docking are still included in the breed standards of both the American and Canadian kennel clubs, despite the fact that um, the AVMA, as far back as 1976, recommended that breed associations remove those requirements. Um, and the Canadian Veterinary uh, Medical Association also opposes it, although I, haven't, I didn't look far enough to find out how far back it might have been doing this. Notice that the AVMA has been recommending this in repeated policy statements from 1976 until the present, which raises that question about the pragmatism of a, a pragmatist bent. There are some things that realistically you're not sure you're going to be able to get changed in the near term, but uh, there's a richer version of that story that I want to give in a second when I get to the notion of common morality. But with regard to um, breed standards, you could expect, um, uh, you could advocate for organizations changing those standards even if uh, so far it hasn't worked. Um, part of the problems with breed standards are that the, they may, the, the associations maintain closed uh, stud books so that you don't get new genetic input, which of course has led over time, as some of these stud books have been closed for over 100 years, to uh, breeds with congenital health problems. And here I did pick a particular breed because my sense is that the as it were, whipping boy when it comes to problem breeds because of genetic issues is the English, pit, uh, the English bulldog. And you see um, about a hundred years ago, an example on the left versus now on the right, and that drawing, it's not an actual x-ray obviously, of the skulls <clears throat> demonstrates to what extent the preferences of breeders and showers and the judges, crucially in showing contests, have caused indirectly in the malformation of, of, of the skull and, and jaw which are accompanied by a range of health problems, and I'm sure you people in the room know far better than I do. <coughs> and I wanted to quote here the CVMA um, in particular because I liked their state policy statement on this issue. They said, we're concerned about breeding dogs with a known or highly su suspect genetic predisposition to inherited disorders. The CVMA is also concerned about the continuation of breeds whose structure and characteristics inherently cause health problems. I just think that's an especially explicit stand that they've taken trying to influence the, the, the um, kennel clubs. So 
Also under the, the, the um, uh, heading, general heading of changing codes of professional ethics, I want to suggest somebody taking um, uh, a risk on developing and trademarking. I have not trademarked certified companion bred dog. I just put it there for dramatic effect. My idea here is to, for an organization like a Humane Society of, of Canada or the United States or something, doing the following and, and copywriting the, the label, take um, a, a, an initial population of animals who all score well on established, currently used tests of health issues, behavioral issues, including non-aggression and trainability, and then take those animals and breed them and then test all of their offspring in the next generation and do the same thing, repeating with only the dogs who score highest in each generation. I'm inspired here partly by that famous experiment in Russia with uh, silver foxes where tame f silver foxes were produced within only about eight or ten generations. So in a short period of time you can cause a lot of morphological and health related and behavioral changes. <coughs> and so my idea here is that if you trademark this label and you establish this line where you know that if you get an animal that's certified companion bred, it's going to be a great dog, e relatively easy to develop what I call a domesticated partnership with. Now you have to luck out and get publicity because you, you have to have it catch on and become something trendy. But the reason I think this is such a cool idea, and one of the main reasons, is that if you did establish this new breed standard that the HUS or Canadian uh, Humane Society would organize and have the trademark on, it could provide a new example of what a good breed of dog is. Now I had trouble choosing a picture here because I wanted just a bunch of mutts who looked very different. These look a little too close to certain breeds that even I know something about, but the idea behind this picture is a certified companion bred dog wouldn't necessarily look a certain way, and it would provide, if that caught on and got popular, a new idea, a new paradigm of what a good breed of dog is that has nothing to do with how it looks and whether or not it resembles an ancestral archetype, for instance. And that could be a cool thing. Okay. Now what about our common morality? I admitted when I introduced this notion that you know, sometimes the standards, the, the norms of common morality can't even be precisely articulated by those of us who have internalized them. And also for present purposes, there's no you know, official written down version of it and there's no you know, community congress at which we say, okay, let's talk about how to change those standards. So it's admittedly a murky, messy area, but I want to emphasize how important it can be because it seems to me that changes in our common morality often have greater potential for affecting changes than do changes in the laws and codes of professional ethics. And I can give an example with regard to the breed standards, with regard to tail docking and ear clip, uh, clipping. Um, the AVMA has been recommending that those be removed from breed standards since 1976, as I emphasized. But if a generation from now, the, our common shared norms had evolved to a point where almost nobody thought it was acceptable to do those things for purely cosmetic reasons, you wouldn't have to ask the AKC and the CKC to remove those from the breeding standards. They would have done it. And that's an illustration of how, in some circumstances, changes in common morality can have profound influence and can make things change faster than the law or a professional organization like a kennel club can. But, admittedly, it's difficult to understand why and how those kinds of changes in common morality occur. Um, here is an illustration of a dramatic change that occurred in the last generation on attitudes towards same-sex marriage. If I think about the attitudes in today and compare them to my parents uh, when they were young, it's completely inverted. So a dramatic change in our common morality um, <clears throat> appears to have occurred with regard to same-sex marriage in something like a generation. It's really hard to say exactly what caused it. Everybody says about this example, you know, it happened, but we can't nail down how it happened. Clearly one factor is celebrities who come out as being gay and also people increasingly across time as more people in everyday life come out as being uh, uh, gay that uh, we increasingly realize, boy, I've known people my whole life who were gay and they were just fine. And so in those subtle ways, attitudes change and they can have dramatic impacts. 
<coughs> now, since we're talking about um, animals and pets and domesticated partners here, think of the so-called blackfish effect. A movie, uh, after it was run on CNN about every hour and a half for a couple of years, appears to have been a catalyst, you know, a crucial little agent of change with regard to SeaWorld's policies towards, um, towards orcas. And I want to mention, although I don't want to put too much stress on this, that I hope that public intellectuals, including, for instance, some philosophers, can sometimes have this kind of nudging effect and catalyst effect on our, commonly, our shared common morality. The best example is probably Peter Singer's work. Um, that book has been enormously influential. Um, it's dissed to some extent by professional philosophers, by academic philosophers, but it's an example of a philosopher doing what philosophers do, writing the way we write, publishing a book that, like the movie and like public personalities, can exert a, a subtle, dis difficult to specify, but profound influence on our common morality. By the way, I don't think that my work is going to have that effect. I just want to say, Philosophers aren't entirely useless. So, so the, the influences surely, as illustrated by my examples there, include things like literature, film, television, and art, uh, celebrities, authorities, public intellectuals, discussions, uh, political discussions in the media, but also around the kitchen table, I mean, you know, the dinner table. And I also want to add here, though, in the last line there, that examples are set by everyday people and what I have in mind there is that, you know, look, if, if you're not somebody who's in a position to have a profound influence on the general public, you can still have a subtle but maybe significant influence on the people who know you to the extent that you work with your dog in a sophisticated way. Or maybe you try to work with your feral cat, training it in various ways. And that can exercise a subtle influence on what the community over time thinks about. Um, uh, uh, it, it can set a, a model for others to emulate to some extent. I don't want to you know, dress this up too much or emphasize it too much, but I think it's a factor there. And so I've talked about these four topics, and I'll stop now. I have no idea what the time is because, oh, and there's a clock up there. <laughs>